Uh, we're looking at a message titled, When You See These Things. Jesus said that, by the way. When you see these things, and you can fill in the blank. He said it numerous portions in the New Testament. When you see these things come to pass, when you see these things, know this. When you see these things, look up. Pretty remarkable stuff. So we're going to be reading right now a collection of Bible verses that relate to, Bible passages that relate to you and I as believers being ready. Why? Because when we look around at the world, there are so much thing, there's so many things happening that it's impossible to cover them all in light of what I'll call stage setting. I'm not saying that this prophecy is being fulfilled right now over there and this one's being fulfilled down there and this... I'm not going to say that, but I will say this. The stage is getting set up, and the show is going to start any day now. So I'll read the odd-numbered verses, if you'll join nice and loud, on the even-numbered verses. And this, again, is a collection of passages from the New Testament arranged for our title today. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Take heed, watch, and pray, for you do not know when the time is. It is like a man going to a far country who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to each his own work and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing. Carousing is just living to party. Drunkenness and cares of this life. And that day come on you unexpectedly. Watch therefore and pray always. I love this. That you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. What I say to you, I say to all, watch. Lord, we pray that your Bible would be, as it were, lifted up off of the pages of this paper, of this ink, and be embossed in our hearts and our minds that because of being in your word today and covering so many passages of scripture and living at a time like this, that, Lord, something so supernatural would transpire in our lives. 
God, we've come here to encounter you. And we ask you, Lord, to have free reign, full control. Take the wheel and govern our lives until we see you face to face, we pray. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Amen. Church, you may be seated. You may be seated. You know, as we come to the end of a of a new year, or the end of this year, and on the, on the heels of a new year, uh, I've often mentioned before that it's a time like this where people are so curious about the future. At, at one year's ending, they get all curious about what's coming. And this has happened, by the way, forever. Since I was a little kid, going through the checkout stand, you'd see all these crazy predictions in these magazines. Uh, they all had this one thing in common, though. All of them, doesn't matter what, what profit. Who was one of the, anybody remember Jean Dixon? Remember Jean Dixon? Is that the right one? She would, she had this prophecy for this and this. Pro- well, whoever they were, because there's a whole bunch of them, uh, they'd all agree on one prophecy. They're, Elvis is coming back this year. <laughs> and everybody like, oh, it's awesome, Elvis. You got to keep our eyes ready for Elvis. And um, never, and he never came. Um, but it's funny because people, they want to delve into the future and they want to guess about it. But the moment you bring them a Bible prophecy verse that talks about the future, they get all offended about it. And, uh, they want to look into the future because they want to have a sense of control. If I know that this is coming, but the funny thing is, what are you going to base your belief on that? Well, this person said, and that person said, you're going to believe them instead of what the Bible says. And people are quite fine to do that. And yet, I just want to remind all of you that the Bible in its prophecies, not one of them have ever been wrong. And the Bible has thousands of prophecies. You think about that for a moment. Just the coming of Jesus in his first coming to Israel, born in Bethlehem, over 300 prophecies were written in advance regarding his physical coming to Israel that were written down hundreds and some of them thousands of years in advance. Incredible, awesome, the Bible. People like Lee Strobel, remember Lee Strobel, anybody? Lee Strobel, great author, you can read his books, uh, Apologetics, great guy, used to be a reporter for the Chicago Sun. Uh, He embarked in his campaign to disprove the Bible. And um, I'm always encouraging people, go and disprove the Bible, get out there, give it all you got. In fact, don't do it halfway because then you won't finish the course. You got to go all out. If you're going to try to disprove the Bible, you got to throw yourself at it, hook, line, and sinker. Why? You say, Pastor, why are you telling people that? Because they'll wind up like Lee Strobel, getting converted and becoming a follower of Christ. What about Josh McDowell? Remember Josh McDowell? Josh McDowell set out to prove that God didn't exist, and he wound up meeting God and became one of the great authors of the 20th century when he wrote, for example, the book, many books, but one of them is Evidence That Demands a Verdict. You must read this book by an atheist who tried to disprove the existence of God. And then what about my favorite guy, the my favorite atheist ever, uh, was C.S. Lewis. (laughs) C.S. Lewis embarked to discredit the Bible and God and wound up getting converted and became one of the great The great uh, defenders of the faith, the great C.S. Lewis. Uh, I just got to throw this in because it's fun. Whenever you get a chance to throw Voltaire, the philosopher, the the mathematician, everything that he thought he was under the bush, you got to take it. Remember Voltaire? Voltaire mocked the Bible, mocked Christianity. Voltaire said, I tell you this, in 40 years, the Bible will be extinct. And the place where he said it the Gutenberg press began to crank out Bibles in mass publication and God had to look over a cloud and go, that's awesome. That's great. God keeps his word, church. He's very faithful to do that. But um, one of the things that you're gonna have to choose to do is you have to choose who to listen to. And I am not asking you to listen to me, that's for sure. But uh, put up on the screen for uh, the, 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 the guy that always uh, steals, steals the show every, at the end of every year. Nostradamus. Have you heard of Nostradamus? So Nostradamus predictions for 2023. So I didn't, know if he, I didn't know he prophesied for 2023. Nobody did. It's just that the people who follow him make this stuff up. But people are willing to believe it. 
By the way, I think, I'll be wrong about this, but I'm close. 71% of Nostradamus' prophecies are correct. But have you read the ones that are correct? When he says what he says, and then somebody says, this is the fulfillment of what he meant, it's like, how do you get that from that? <laughs> it's insane. And you'll see how insane it is in a moment. But according to these people, World War III is going to begin. I, I kind of thought, think we're already in it. Anyway, that's another story. Mars landing, celestial fire, and much more. Well, this is interesting, because I'm going to give you a couple of these things. Number one, let's look at his prediction regarding world war. Nostradamus wrote, and I quote, here it is. Here's the prophecy. Seven months of the great war, people dead of evil. Died of evil, dead of evil. That's it. Evil doing. Seven months, the great war, people dead of evil doing. What does that mean? What in the world does that mean? Oh, they're going to tell us what it means. This has been predicted as the conflict in Ukraine caused by Russia's invasion, which can grow even bigger, resulting in World War III. I'm not joking, people. I'm telling you, this is, this is right from the Nostradamites. <laughs> or, they said, or, or it could refer to the ongoing conflict in Southeast Asia between China and Taiwan, which threatens to drag the United States into a terrifying nuclear war. So which one is it? I submit this to you. If the Bible was that vague, we wouldn't be sitting here right now. This is insane, but people want to believe this over the Bible. Next slide. Mars landing. Nostradamus wrote, quote, light on Mars falling. That's a uh, close quote. That's it. What does that mean? Oh, they're going to tell us. As we look out into our galaxy, the French mystic cryptically refers to these words that could be explained as the planet Mars appearing to move backward in the sky, say believers. Or it could suggest that humanity could be on the verge of a major breakthrough when it comes to colonizing the red planet. Elon Musk has made no secret of his desire to send humans to Mars and has suggested that humans will land there by 2029. So maybe the billionaire has something up his sleeve. They get all that stuff out from just those stewards. Can I submit to you today that the Bible is so accurate regarding its prophecies that people look at the accuracy of the Bible. You got to remember 100% of what's been prophesied that's been fulfilled has been fulfilled 100% according to the prophecy. What does that mean to me? What does it mean to you? That whatever is left in the Bible will be 100% fulfilled exactly as God said. That to me is awesome because it really slaps doubt in the face and causes you to have to sit up and take notice. Three things I want to give you before we dive into this part two of our study. The Bible defends itself against the claims of man. Now, people always have a hard time with this. Oh, don't argue to me about the Bible and the existence of God if you're going to use the Bible. <laughs> well, why not? In fact, if you really think about it, you want to disprove the existence of God and you don't believe the Bible is true, but I'm going to argue with you, with you from the Bible so you would think that if your premise is true, you'd be happy to have me argue my case from the Bible because you don't think the Bible's true. So you could easily destroy my argument. Does that make sense? Did I, is it too early for that? Okay, did you get, so here's the deal. If I use the word of God, I should be very fragile and vulnerable if your argument's true that God doesn't exist or the Bible's wrong. The reality is that the Bible defends against those kinds of claims. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. The Bible says it of itself. The Bible was breathed out by God. That's a huge claim. Either man wrote it or God wrote it. Which one is it? The second thing is this. The Bible authenticates itself against the spirit of error. I love that. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. Look at this. Listen carefully. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed which you do well to take heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first. Now, you, as I read this, think about that Nostradamus stuff. 
Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. You can't turn in your Bible and say, you know what this means to me? You can't do that. I mean, you can do that, but you'll be called a heretic or a cultist. You can't make stuff up like that. The Bible doesn't allow for that. For prophecy, look at this, verse 21. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but by But holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The word moved can also be translated possessed. I like that. How did God communicate to us? He possessed a human being called the prophets, for example, wrote it down, and then time would be its test. And if Nostradamus has got a 71% chance of being right, does anybody know what the Bible says about a biblical prophet if they're wrong once? Stoned. Not, not dope, not pot, not drunk, not stone. I'm talking with rocks, not drugs. That prophet's to be stoned. Why does God, why you say, man, kind of edgy, isn't he? What's the deal on that? Because your soul's at stake. If somebody teaches you falsely and leads you in the wrong thinking down the wrong path, you wind up where you don't even have a thought of going to, nor would Satan ever want you to know this, but it's called Hell. You follow a lie from the father of all lies right into hell. And how does God, or how does this devil do that? He wraps it in religiosity and deceives people with false prophecies. We want to be very careful about that. And then finally this, the Bible quantifies itself against the property of time. This is one of the most fun things ever. Time. The property of time. The Bible tells us that God governs time. He moves time. He's the governor of it. Isaiah chapter 9, write it down, and you're not going to see it on the screens. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 tells us regarding the Messiah that he's the father of time. God manages time. That very thing that is fleeting from you, always fleeting from you, God governs it. The Bible tells us, listen, In John 13, 19, listen to this. Jesus is speaking and he says, now I tell you before it comes that when it does come to pass, follow me now, you may believe that I am, and look in your Bibles, it has the word he in it in your Bible. I should have actually changed it on there. In the original Greek language of the scriptures, the word he is not in the Bible. The translators put he. That's why if you look in your Bible, it's, it's italicized, isn't it? Why? Because it's not there in the original language. Are you ready for this? This is Jesus speaking. Now, I tell you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am who I am. It's the Greek words, ego me. What is that? Well, you've, you know the Hebrew words. When Moses is looking at the burning bush, and he speaks atop Mount Sinai to the burning bush, the voice comes out of the burning bush when he says, who do I tell the children of Israel sent me? You tell them I am that I am sent you. In the Hebrew, it's translated in the Greek, I am who I am. What does that mean? Jesus is speaking, claiming to be the one at the burning bush who is the self-contained eternal existing God. You say, well, that's a big statement. Well, I want you to take notes. Write this down. Because we're going to, I'm going to give you several passages to back all that up. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 9. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I declare before they spring forth, I tell you of them. The God of the Bible knows the future. Isaiah 45, 21. Tell and bring forth your case. Yes, let them take counsel together. Who has declared it from ancient time? Listen to him. Who has told it from that time? Have not I, the Lord? And there is no other God beside me. A just God and Savior. Did you think Jesus was your Savior? He is. Jesus is God. There is none besides me. Look to me. And be saved, all you ends of the earth. That's a 3,000-year-old prophecy, church. 1,000 years or 
750 years before Christ was born. How about this? Isaiah 46, verse 9 and 10. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, I will do all my pleasure. This is the God of the Bible. He writes the future down in advance. It's called Bible prophecy. And it's not vague. It's very exact. It's very direct. Revelation chapter 19, verse 10. You guys all right? Yes. Revelation 19, 10. For the spirit of Jesus, or the testimony of Jesus, is the spirit of prophecy. That's huge. And then Luke 21, 28. Jesus said, now when you see these things begin to happen, look up. I love this. Three things. Look up, lift up your heads. How come? Because your redemption draws near. Let's, 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 let's leave that on the screen. That's awesome. So watch this. It's always fun when you're studying the Bible to do this, uh, to do this when you're studying scripture. Because your redemption draws near, I need to lift up my head. You see that? Watch how I'm reading this. I need to look up. When I see these things begin to happen. See, I read that backwards. When you study the Bible, you read it forward, you read it backwards. Sometimes you read it in between. You saturate yourself with it. Jesus said, when, you, when these things, he's expecting you to know the things. The Bible talks about certain things that will trigger the responsibility for every true believer to be looking up, to be lifting up their head. It doesn't mean you walk around like this. What are you doing? I'm a Christian. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking for Jesus. It doesn't mean that. It means that your eyeballs are in the front of your face, spiritually speaking. Have your spiritual eyes looking up. Lift up your head. Be ready. Why? Your redemption's drawing near. How do I know? Look around. That's what that verse means. What's happening in the world right now? Look at what's taking place. Does the Bible speak to these things? And the answer is yes. We saw last time that regarding this challenge by Jesus, when you see these things, we saw that regarding a one world global government and faith. And if you were not here, you can uh, look and study it online. We talked about that. The Bible says right before Christ returns, there's going to be talk about a global government and a one world faith. And we gave you some images and some links to that. Number two, regarding a one world global economy, that whatever goes on in the world, the Bible says there's going to be what comes out of it, a one world global economy. And that economy will be conducted by a currency, which was our third lesson last time together. That the last days are going to be marked by a one digitized, we now understand, global currency. It's numeric. Remember, we ended last week with the number 666. Yeah, I mean, even, listen, even non-believers have heard about the number 666. Some people, I don't, I don't like that on my license plate. <laughs> it, Doug, just calm down. It's Okay. But the number 666 is the declaration of man declaring himself to be God, and we know him as the Antichrist. But he's going to implement a currency. And that currency is going to be one that the Bible says, if you don't have his number on your account, you will not be able to sell anything, and you won't be able to buy anything. And the Bible says a great amount of people will die because of that. And then here we go. We pick it up where we left off. Number four is when you see these things regarding confusion and misinformation. We had to cut this short last time together. I was shocked to find out, maybe not. It's just shocking, I guess, to hear it for the first time. Is that? Did you know that most people are under the age of 40? Do you know that they get their news from Twitter, in this order, Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook? The fourth thing, you know what the fourth thing was? The fourth thing was, how many of you have an Apple phone? Raise your hand, Apple phone. I don't know the other devices. Android. Android. Whatever that stuff is, I don't know. So the, the worst thing ever, do you have Apple News on your Apple phone? That is the most corrupt, bias, insane news ever. And young people go like this, oh, wow. Uh, uh, what? 
a guy just gave birth to a baby in, in Manitoba. Unbelievable stuff on Apple News. If you have Apple News, I think it's built into your phone. I don't even think you can get rid of it, can you? Can you kill it? Can you get it out of there? So some of you smart guys are going, you can, you can get it out. It's unbelievable stuff, but here's the deal. Give me, a, give me a 15 second thing on that news. What was it? That's the news? Okay, I got it. And then people believe it. Deception and misinformation, confusion. Jesus said in Matthew 24, verses four and five, which is remarkable, when the disciples asked, when the disciples asked him, give us a sign about the end of the world. Okay. Take heed that nobody deceives you. Deception will permeate the last days. For many will come in my name, saying I am the Christ and will deceive many. That's a reference to false religions and false messiahs. And now you can pick and choose. Remarkable, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Very familiar verse if you attend this church. Now the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit expressly says, he's not messing around, that in the latter times some will depart from the faith. Ministry, people, we've never seen it like this before. Keep, it, keep the verse up there. We've never seen life like this as it is now. People departing from the faith, people that you thought would be with us all the way through to the end are given up. Husbands and wives are giving up on family, on, on one another, and it makes no sense. They got married last week or they've been married 70 years. They're saying, I don't want a divorce, I want out. I don't, or I don't believe anymore. Never seen it like this before. You say, well, Pastor, that's because you're older and you hear more. And it's, no, 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 no. Because, I, listen, I have pastor friends all over the U.S. And they're going through, the, they're watching the same thing happen. Doesn't matter how big or small the church is. Something's up, people. Something's up. To have this, almost this invisible little lever that you entertain. That if things really get tough, you'll just pull that lever and bail out. Some will depart from the faith. Apostasy. Why? Giving heed to deceiving spirits. Listen, a deceiving spirit's not going to come up and go, <laughs> I'm here to deceive you. Follow me. It's going to be so cloaked, so beautifully. Can we remember that Eve was no dummy? That she was perfect. And when Satan spoke to her, it sounded and felt so good, she had to have it. It was so appealing that she had to choose what Satan was offering because it sounded better than what God can give. And she went for it. In these last days, you're going to see increased attacks against your life. Just know this. It's going to be coming from deceiving spirits, invisible entities that will lie to you in your head. Look, it's one thing to see this television program, this movie, this article, this book, lying to you. But one of the most dangerous things is to get a thought in your head and you ponder that thought. And Satan works this way. Go ahead and leave it on the screen. Deceiving spirits. You know what? It's my 25th high school anniversary or reunion. Oh, maybe I should go. Well, wait, wait, wait. How was your high school experience? Well, I just want to see what's going on. Well, uh, you think that's wise? Uh, who's going to be there? Oh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe Karen's going to be there. Or maybe, maybe Mike will be there. Who's that? Oh, just friends. <laughs> friends I haven't talked to you in 25 years. And last time I talked to them, it was like not good. But <laughs> where did that come from? Deceiving spirits. And you start to get curious. Well, I wonder what they look like now. You know, that's a big whopper, right? That's a big one. I used to work with this person or that thing. And it starts subtly like that. Oh, it's just a little, it's just a little search. What's that going to matter? Is it wise? Watch out. And doctrines of demons. Demons propagating misinformation and confusion to the masses, starting with you, starting with me. Think of it. 
Remember, everything that we're reading regarding scripture has already been tested and tried and attacked. And here we are reading 2,000 years old, this statement that fits like tomorrow's news. Isn't that amazing? Speaking lies and hypocrisy. That's always amazing. Don't do this as I do it. I can do it, but you can't do it. I can go to the French laundry and have dinner, but you can't. You wear a mask, I don't have to. Right? I use Bible verses, you're not allowed to. <laughs> Having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. That word simply means that they can't feel anything anymore. It's a perfect, perfect definition of a narcissist. They can't feel anymore. Somebody could be bleeding out in front of them or crying or have a broken heart and they're, they're like this. What's for dinner? Right. Have you ever seen people like this? Yeah. There's no sympathy, there's no empathy, there's no love, there's no heart. Their conscience is gone. And we live in a world, according to Jesus, and we can agree. Remarkable. Number five, when you see these things regarding the affection of man's heart, his affections. The Bible tells us that in the last days, in fact, I'll give you the the verse right now, watch this, it's 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 5. This is amazing. Again, for those of you who are new, you're new to the Bible, or maybe you're just uh, you're, you're hearing this for the first time, again, this is a 2,000-year-old statement. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves. Watch this. Lovers of money. Now, technically... You could, without doing any damage, keep reading it this way. Look to the screen. That's the scriptures, but watch how I read this. Lovers of themselves, lovers of money. They love to boast. They love it. They love to be proud. They love to blaspheme. They love to be disobedient to their parents. They love being unthankful. Unholy, unloving, unforgiving. They love to slander other people. That's called the internet, social media. Without self-control, brutal, despisers of good. They love to break an agreement. They love to be traitors. They love being stubborn or headstrong. They love being haughty. That's a great word, isn't it? Haughty. What is haughty? Haughty is, I'm so, last time I checked, I was so much better than you. self-absorbed, right? They love, listen, lovers of pleasure. That's the punchline, rather than lovers of God. And having a form of godliness, but denying its power. You know what that means? That means you'll find them in church. People like that. In the last days. Pretty scary, right? Think about it. Lovers, listen, whenever you're a lover of yourself, you're deifying yourself. And that's one of the scourges of the last days. One of the things that you and I are living through right now is actual Bible prophecy regarding this portion of scripture. And I say this for accuracy. I have nobody's, nobody's life in my mind right now. No one told me that you were going to be here. <laughs> but isn't it interesting today? We're, we are being told what we are to approve of and what we are to like. And we are being told what to love. And if you don't, you're going to pay a price. For example, I'm being told, you're being told that we must love this or we must love that. We must submit to this narrative or we must submit to that narrative. Are you hearing me? We must approve of this lifestyle or this course of decision making. You must join the team. If you don't, you're going to be fired. Literally, social belief systems that once was a personal issue, now threaten your very existence. How did this happen? You guys, I am so old that when I used to, the last application I filled out was in 1980. And back in those days, in this state, you couldn't ask anybody regarding their gender, their ethnicity, religion. It was against the law. Did you know that? 
Nowadays, nowadays, apparent, <coughs> excuse me, apparently, your qualifications don't matter. But if you meet this standard, we are this way, this is what our rules are regarding this company. It used to be where you got a job because you had the skills to do the job. Now, it's more important to the company that you acquiesce to their social agenda. Where does this come from? Demonic influence in the lives of mankind. It's biblical, people. Not everybody's taking stupid pills around the world. It's demonic. It's like it's in the air. It's satanic persuasion. And the Bible says that the world is under the sway of the wicked one. You say, I don't believe that. He's got you right where he wants you. That's exactly where he's got, he's already, he already has you. It's remarkable. But if you say today, you know what, I'm my own thinker, I've got my own opinion, and it doesn't affect any way I, how I do this job, it's unacceptable. Look, today, did you see the breaking news today? What uh, Apple is, they picked up the phone, I guess, and they called Elon Musk. And they said, you either submit to our, pol our social media policies, or we're going to pull Twitter from Apple phones. And did you see what Elon Musk said? Because he's already, he already planned on this. He said, I'm going to make my own phone. <laughs> that's pretty cool. That's pretty, that's pretty Elon Musk of him. <laughs> Number six, everybody, when you see these things, Jesus challenges us regarding wars and rumors of wars. Wars and rumors of wars. Isn't it amazing the Bible says, you say, well, there's always wars and rumors of wars. Yes, but in the context of Matthew 24, Jesus is talking about on a global scale. Think of it now for a moment. For those of you who are skeptics, we have an itinerant preacher who was raised as a carpenter by his stepdad in a little country town up north called Nazareth. A lot of scandalous talk about his coming into the world and his mother and all that stuff, but we've moved on from that. It's been some 30 years. And now he comes on the scene and he says, hey, you asked me a question about what's it gonna be like at the end of the world? Well, one of the things will be that there's gonna be a global conversation taking place. It's going to be rumored about constantly about wars. Oh, and there will be wars. I want to remind you that just think if you, I'll, I'm going to be off on this, but World War I ended, when was that, 1913 or 14? 17, 17 1917. World War I, then they thought that was the war to end all wars. That was so horrific. Well, there'll never be a war again. And Europe was back at it in the late 30s and 40s. 39. And then now we're on the brink where a lot of people are saying that at this state of time in human history that the Third World War has already started. It's just different nowadays. It's not about blowing stuff up. It's about taking things over in the invisible cyber world and all the things that are going on with that. Well, one thing is sure and certain. Jesus said, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that you're not troubled. That word means expect it. For all these things must come to pass, but the end, that is the end of the world, is not yet. And I want to show you a list right now. I think we have this list. I want you to just look at this. These are the conversations in news now today. China versus Taiwan. Unless something happens, ladies and gentlemen, which I, I guess it's not going, who knows? China could swallow up Taiwan and the world would just keep going. America would do nothing. America, I don't think, can. China versus the United States. That's always on the table and, and increasing. Believe it or not, Venezuela versus the United States. Are you kidding me? 
there have been some serious weaponry that Iran and Russia has, have moved into Venezuela pointed at us. Right now, they're there. North Korea versus Japan. This is so sad for Japan because when Japan tried to take over the world and we beat them up, we said, no, no armies and navies for you. We'll be your protector. Sign here and you can't do this anymore because we can't trust you guys. So we'll be your protector, big old big brother America. We're going to take care of you. And so now North Korea wants to beat up Japan and Japan's like reaching in its pocket and ain't got nothing to defend itself with. Look into America. And North Korea versus United States. What's his name? He's been launching uh, test ICBMs again. Iran versus the United States. This has been going on for a very long time. Russia versus the United States. Russia versus Israel. That's a constant dynamic. Because Russia is in an interesting way because it uses, it uses land that's north of Israel, like Syria, it use it possibly areas of Lebanon via Hezbollah. We'll see that in a second. But if you know Ezekiel chapter 38, the Bible speaks exactly as to what eventually will happen regarding Russia and Israel. Now, when I say Lebanon versus Israel, this is not Lebanon, the nation that you would know. This is Hezbollah who has, take, who has commandeered Lebanon. And they are sworn enemies of Israel to wipe it off the face of the earth. Iran versus Israel. Iran versus Saudi Arabia. Did you know that these two are constantly pointing weapons at each other to annihilate each other? Did you know that they can't stand each other? They are the two different houses of Islam. They're both Islamic, but one is of the descendancy of Muhammad, and the other one is a descendancy from a relative. And they'll kill each other if they get the chance. And this one, I'm surprised hasn't happened yet. I'm not sure if you've watched the news regarding India and Pakistan. But it's always on the verge. You say, Jack, why do you point these things out? Jesus said there'll be days like this. Jesus said there'll be days like this. There'll be days like this, my Jesus said. Yeah. <laughs> it inspired a song. I'm kidding. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, do we have a slide, guys, for this? Or that's, there you go. Look at this. Here's, here's one thing right now in the news happening now. Syrian Kurds suspend anti-ISIS operations to brace for Turkish invasion. This is a big deal. It's been announced to Turkey that Turkey is about to invade Syria. Here's the tough part. Is that most likely it's going to involve the United States. You say, What? Um, you remember, we just got done fighting decades of, of war. You say, well, why, why is this even being discussed? Why would we help in this situation? Now remember, all of this flies under the banner of wars and rumors of wars. Um, who's the author of the book? I have the book. I just can't think of his name. Sin Tzu, is that, am I saying it right? The Art of War? Sin Tzu, is that right? Do you know when your economy is in bad condition? Do you know what you do when your economy stinks? <laughs> you read the book. You start a war. Why did Hitler stir up Europe and start a war? Because their economy was in the tank. Whenever your economy stinks, start a war. It does wonders for your economy. Why would we get involved in this? Because our economy is in the tank. Pretty weird, isn't it? Pretty strange. So as a skeptic, you've got to be thinking, do I believe in the Bible or not? Jesus said there'd be wars and rumors of wars before the end. Number seven, regarding a world in rebellion to Christ. That would be increasing. And I'm going to give you three passages of scripture that you're going to want to remember and write them down in your Bibles, especially in your margins of your Bibles. 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. 1 John 2, 18. Little children, 
it is the last hour. A <laughs> guy loved John. He's not even talking about last days. John looked at his sundial on his wrist and said, man, we're done. It's like the last hour. I love that. It is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. 2,000 years ago, John had his eyes open, as it were, in his head, looking up. Next verse. Check this out. 1 John 2, 22. Who is a liar, but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Listen, that's a reference to the Trinity, if you think about it. If you deny the deity of Jesus Christ, the Bible says that's because you have a spirit of Antichrist governing your life. Well, I believe in Jesus, but I don't believe that he's who he says he was or who the Bible says he was. That thinking comes from the spirit, the atmosphere of Antichrist. Remarkable, isn't it? Look at 2 John. 2 John 7 says, But many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Friends, many of your cults that you encounter with friends or at your doorstep hold to this view. Remarkable. I just find it fascinating, always fascinating, that once somebody denies Jesus Christ, they become a denier <laughs> Of all things God, it's remarkable. Number eight, mark it down. Number eight, regarding what is next on the world scene. What's next on the world scene? People want to know. That's what your newsstands are saying in the grocery stores. What's next? Makes me, uh, I don't know. I, I don't think normal. I, if, if, I, if I were a computer hacker, this is how I'd spend my time. You know how people always look for directions at P.F. Chang's? <laughs> it's the fortune cookie. <laughs> and it's funny because after you're done eating, it's like, are you going to eat the cookie? <laughs> Everybody, what, what are you going to do with your cookie? You're not going to throw it out, are you? Oh, you like them? Huh? No, they're horrible. I want to see what's inside. <laughs> Have you noticed that? Are you like that? You... By the way, have you noticed, fortune cookies are amazing. You're so awesome. You open it up, you're going to meet somebody really interesting tomorrow. It's always just this stuff. Wouldn't you like, if I was a hacker, I'd like to hack into the machine that makes those things and put Bible verses in there. Can you imagine? And then I'd ship them all to China. <laughs> Can you imagine? Imagine. They open up all these cookies, billion cookies. Every, you start seeing people getting saved all across China because they're reading a fortune cookie. <laughs> what was in that cookie? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever could be me, would believe in him, would not perish, but have everlasting life. Give me that cookie. <laughs> right? Amazing. Everybody wants to know, what does the new year hold? Well, I don't know. We can speculate. But I have this little list. Uh, first of all, the imminent and sudden appearing of Jesus Christ. That's what I'm rooting for. Or a rush toward worldwide economic solution because the world is in trouble and it's increasingly in debt. Or an imminent re return and sudden appearing of Jesus Christ. <laughs> or an aggressive attempt to reinstate some form of global fear tactic. Like what's happening right now in China, right now, as I speak. The poor Chinese people in Shanghai, in uh, other places, the brutality that's taking place right now, they're, st they're stirring up the next wave to get you masked up and vaxxed up in something new. And they're starting it now. Because the first pass didn't work. or the imminent and sudden appearing of Jesus Christ. <laughs> if that doesn't happen, then you can maybe look forward to an obscure, but yet fulfilled destruction of Damascus. You say, what? Isn't this something? Right out of the blue, listen, a lot of biblical scholars in Isaiah chapter 17, they have a hard time placing this particular prophecy in the Bible because the Bible says 
that regarding Damascus, in conjunction with Jeremiah, that Damascus, it says, in the walls of Damascus, there's going to be a fire that begins, and it is going to consume Damascus. And it's going to be so bad, it says, that Damascus will never be inhabited again by a human being. And when that happens, it says Israel will suffer from it. Israel and Damascus so close together, that city to the border. Isn't that an interesting, that's Isaiah 17. And scholars don't know, is that possibly the trigger to the Ezekiel 38 battle? But one thing we know for sure, right now Damascus is very well populated. But the Bible says there's coming a day when it's going to be uninhabitable. Somebody could, in this day and age, somebody could trip over something and set off a nuke. Set off something. Who knows? Wow. Or the imminent and sudden appearing of Jesus Christ. Or a Russian-led Islamic coalition to destroy Israel. Ezekiel 38. Or the imminent or sudden appearing of Jesus Christ. Or an increased global destabilization of laws and rules and order. The world's losing control of itself. This one, you know, laws, rules, and order. So I just bailed out yesterday on a, on a trip. Lisa and I, we need a trip. And so I planned this trip, and I had to cancel because the U.S. State Department said, if you go to that country, you cannot go in these cities. They are unsafe. They're kidnapping Americans. So, man, I want my money back. (laughs) Had to cancel a trip because of violence, of people stealing other people. Interesting. Weird. Jesus said, because in the last days, because the love of many will grow cold, he said violence will escalate. Jesus said that in in Matthew 24, church, you guys awake? Is that not happening? There used to be a day when you could go downtown LA or Oliveira Street, walk around in the middle of the night. I remember being in New York City, walking through Central Park at two o'clock in the morning. We landed and had a layover. What do you do? We've got like eight hours. What do we do? Come on, guys, let's go. Let's get out of here. We'll walk through Central Park. It was perfectly fine. Now you don't do that now. It's crazy. Or the imminent and sudden appearing of Jesus Christ. Or an utter collapse of Europe as we know it today. You guys, Europe is hanging on a thread. Like this. Europe is godless, leaderless, and it's in trouble. Or the imminent and sudden appearing of Jesus Christ. You say, what do you keep saying that for? Because he could come at any moment before any of these things happen. So very quickly, we end with these last two regarding the preparing of his church. I believe God's preparing his church. I believe God's people are going to be doing their jobs, getting married, going to school, doing what you're supposed to do, occupy till he comes, live your life. But at the exact same time, you got your head, as it were, spiritually up. You're looking for him all the while. You're doing the hardest thing of all, and that is disciplining your life to stay the course. You got to be ready to meet him today, but plan for the next 100 years. You think about that. But we need to do this for sure. Jude chapter one, verse 20 starts there by saying, but you beloved, this is it, but you beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God. That's a great marching order. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. What a great statement. And then finally, number 10, when you see these things regarding living out our lives until he comes, you and I are going to choose how how we're going to live out the rest of our days. And I want to give you this verse and then a commissioning. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, 
always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. And you do that with meekness and with fear or with honor and respect as you share Christ with others. So church, honestly, stand. I'm gonna give you some marching orders. These are things that we need to have in our lives active from this moment on. I just wrote down in my notes to myself, I just called them countermeasures. Whatever the enemy's throwing at you, your home, your life, your business, your health, God in his word gives us countermeasures. Number one, having the right attitude. Have the right attitude about what's going on. Listen, if you're gonna follow Jesus, it's gonna be tough. Can somebody say amen to this? Amen. It's gonna be tough. This is so tough of a time. We have to fight and get our minds and our attitudes right in line with scripture because our emotions are so strong and we are so opinionated with our emotions. Watch out. Measure, countermeasure, number one, having the right attitude. Number two, countermeasure, keep yourself ready. Amen. Keep yourself ready. Watch out for things that would cause you to get sloppy about your life, spiritually speaking. Well, I've been going to church for six months now. I'm going to take the next six months off. Don't do that. <laughs> this church stinks. Then go to a church that doesn't stink. <laughs> but don't stop. Keep yourself ready. Third countermeasure, avoid compromising situations. Well, you know, no, no, no. I was just curious. Stop it. I just want to see what it'd be like. Get over here. <laughs> Countermeasure number four, resist complacency and spiritual laziness. Oof. This is dangerous for all of us. Complacency and spiritual laziness. It's like, uh, again. Number five, exercise extreme judgment regarding information. Simply put, don't believe it. Well, what if you're saying it? Don't believe it. You're supposed to do an Acts 17, 11 on people. Test, test everything you hear against the scripture. Well, did you hear what this guy said? I don't want to hear it. Or if I have to hear it, I want to judge it through the Bible. And then finally this, galvanize yourself with the Bible. Amen. I like the word galvanize. I like that. Why do you galvanize something? To keep it from rusting. Galvanize, you know, stuff galvanized, it's not pretty. Have you noticed that? So look at that thing, it's so shiny over there. It's not galvanized. Not the way I understand it anyway. It's so, so glittery and shiny. That's great. But you know what? For the long haul, I'll take the one that's galvanized. It means it has been treated in such a way that it's impervious to the environment around it. It can snow, rain, hail, heat. It's just there. And to me, that's a picture of the Christian. We've been galvanized. The world looks at us and throws heat at us. It throws cold. It throws hail and mud at us. And we're like this. It's just, I mean, it hits us, but it doesn't stick. And how does that happen? We are galvanized with the word of God. Know the word and be safe. Thank you, Lord, for sending us Jesus, the living word of God, who died on the cross for our sins, rose again from the dead. And Lord, so beautifully... The very testimony of Jesus is that spirit of prophecy whereby we can know that the word of God is true and steadfast, immovable. And Lord, we can have confidence in whatever your Bible tells us. We can grab a verse, we can grab a promise and lay hold of it. So Father, I pray God for this service as these people depart from this place. Lord God, may they go with a sense of alertness to the world around them, zeal for what is right, and knowledge of the word of God that they might walk in this world, as it were, as lights in shining armor. So Father, we praise you and thank you for Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you. We'll see you Wednesday night.